Less Than Human by Steve Lines. The tower attacked the creek trenches an hour before sunrise, using the cover of scorched and battered trees to their advantage. They wore red battle suits similar to those seen by the creek before. Only these were more compact, and somehow they didn't stand out against the force as they ought to have done. They seemed to bend light around themselves. The first sentry to look directly at one checked his monoculars for flaws. He continued to scrutinize the odd skimmer in the air, and once he was certain that it was sneaking closer, he sounded the alarm. Creep corpsmen rolled from their bunks and thronged to their places on fire steps through the dark lenses of a breather mask. Their keen eyes scoured the scarred terrain ahead of them. They chewed and loaded their venerable Earthshaker guns and held them in abeyance until they had more information. Though they worked quietly, saying few words aloud, sounds of their activity carried through the still damp air. Seeing that stealth had brought them as far as it could, the Tau dispelled the pre-dawn gloom with a fusillade of pulse fire. The Krieg made out their shapes now, yet couldn't quite bring them into focus. Impatient cannons roared as they were finally unleashed. It was unclear if the Tau were caught in their deadly blast, but their advance was barely slowed. Hundreds of Krieg barrels popped and cracked as targets entered their range. Amid the bright pulse beams, their output looked anemic. The rate of fire slower, but their wielders, dug in behind their walls, had time on their side. Their overclocked las guns chipped away at the Tau shells, wearing them down until first one and then another toppled. Some made it through the light storm. Even so, they tore through barbed wire coils, kicked sandbags aside with contemptuous ease. Suddenly, there were six, maybe even seven Tau among the Krieg in the forward trenches. Their battle suits, fashioned from some arcane Xenos alloy, were lightweight but robust, giving them a huge advantage in close combat. The Krieg, in turn, had far superior numbers, even in such cramped confines. Their ears ringing. Junior officers pumped bolter rounds into Tau armor, creating fractures. Knives and bayonets lever those fault lines open. The stealth-suited Tau were not a lone force, but scouts for Hunter Cadre. As they occupied their enemies, the rest of the company charged up through the force in their wake. A broad-nosed gunship forced its way through the knot of brittle trees balancing on anti-grav engines. Laser beams swept and burnt ground in its path, seeking prey for its missiles and its ion cannons. It was chewed by an eager team of fire warriors, while ten more teams kept pace with it on foot. In the trenches, the Tau scouts were proving more resilient than skilled, too proud of the blasphemous technology the enemies considered, and far too reliant upon it. Their arm-mounted guns sprayed plasma fire about themselves. They fought to reach the Earthshakers and disable them, either by reducing them to slag or by killing their crews. They didn't care which. Urgent directives buzzed in Krieg earpieces. They had to deal with those invaders quickly before the larger threat overran them. As always, they rose to the challenge. One by one, the Tau scouts were peeled from their armor, exposing leathery gray-blue hides and flat, noseless faces. One pleaded for mercy in vain. In some alien tongue, while another self-destructed as its life ebbed from its body. It took three corpsmen with it, wounding several more. The last scowl triggered its jetpack, attempting to escape, unable to shake the deathly grips of a dozen gloved hands. It was dragged back down with to a grisly fate. The Krieg crewed their cannons and shouldered their lasguns again, 
The charging fire warriors had crossed just half the distance to them, were now facing a deadlier gauntlet than they had been prepared for. A well-placed shell vaporized a five-strong squad of them, and by the time the smoke of the explosion cleared, the comrades were in full retreat. The skirmish was over as quickly as it begun. Creed quartermasters dealt with the wounded and the dead, while the sentries resumed their watches. Engineers worked on the damaged guns and continued to, to dig sap tunnels from the trenches towards the town encampment. They waited for the next wave of attackers to come, marching into their clutches. A thousand tons of metal dropped from the screaming sky. Two devourer dropships crashed through the forest canopy unheeding of the carnage they were wrecking and the wildlife they cremated. The Imperium of Man had no regard for this small backwater world. Its mineral resources were unworthy of the effort to extract them. Its soil excreted a toxic gas in the winter, which made it unsuitable for colonization without extensive terraforming. They hadn't even cherished it, only given it a number denoting its position from the sun. The Imperium's sole interest in this world was that they didn't want anyone else to have it. Captain Villemine Stitchell watched, stone-faced as her army marched down the loading ramps. The sight of them, mustering in their blue and gold dress uniforms, caused her to swell with pride. Their belts, boots, and cap peaks gleamed in the midday light. They were Mordian Iron Guard. Disciplined, dutiful, efficient. They left their artillery in storage. It was quicker to march the few miles to the designation than a clear path for vehicles. And anyway, the Krieg were already well stocked in that department. The mission here ought to have been simple. A Tau Pathfinder team had landed on this world, presumably assessing it for use as a military outpost. They had to know that it would cost them more to take it than it was worth. They had to be eradicated. The Krieg outnumbered their foes, and yet they failed to make such headway against them. Stigil had been dispatched to end the deadlock. At her request, her troop ship remained in planetary orbit. If she wasn't done here within a day or two, then she wasn't worthy of the badges and medals that she wore. The Creek commander dugout was cramped and dirty, unbefitting of his rank. Stitchell declined the offer of a stool, preferring to keep her uniform pristine. She grimaced as she knocked her head on a lumen globe strung from a low roof. Her opposite number wore a tank commander's insignia on his buttoned-up greatcoat. He introduced himself as his company's acting captain, but didn't give a name. My predecessor was killed during her last deployment. He explained. His life, he made a point of adding, was expended well. Still, Stitchell considered, your company is somewhat under strength. We await reinforcements from home world. I'm sure that must affect morale. Why would it? Asked the Kriegman. A rebreather mask concealed his face. Sitchell thought it was discourteous of him not to have removed it, so she couldn't see his expression, but he sounded genuinely puzzled. She dismissed this odd reaction with a mental shrug. Clearly, she told herself, these soldiers need whipping into shape. She cast an eye over the Cree captain's tactical hololith. She noted the enemy's assumed positions and the layout of the Krieg trenches. She motioned her command staff to inspect the data too. She asked what had been achieved in the past 48 hours. The Krieg captain nodded to a tactician, masked like the rest of his people, who caressed the bank of control rooms. The sprawling light image barely changed. Why haven't you pushed forward? Stitchell demanded. We were gaining half, almost half a mile per day, the Cree captain stated. Not nearly enough. The Tau are not like orcs, 
not unsophisticated brutes. Sitchell's company had been fighting orcs in the Armageddon system for ten months. The Creed men had done his homework. They make the most of their tactical advantages. My ordinance have run the numbers. A frontal assault would result in... Stitchell interrupted him. That may have been true until today. More boots on the ground will make a difference. The Greek captain conceded, but the Tau can hardly be unaware of your arrival. Good. I wanted them to see. They'll expect an attack and will have built up the defenses. We are beating them, Captain Stitchell. They may possess tactical competence, but the Tau lack my troops' patience. They will come to us in time. They already have. Three times and suffered savage losses. So this is the infamous Death Corps of Krieg. Thought Stitchell. The Emperor's most ruthless soldiers, zealous to a point of self-destruction. Or so she had been told. The potter was pleased to confirm her suspicions about them. The reputation had been grossly overblown. She waved her swagger stick over the hololith. No more cowering in tunnels, she decreed. Captain Stitchell, said the Cree captain naively. In four more days, we can extend those tunnels under the enemy encampment. We can collapse the ground beneath their feet and they'll never see it coming. Hooves, said Stitcher with a scowl. These creatures don't have feet. They have hooves. And in four more hours, we can wipe their Xeno stink from this planet. My way will expend far fewer resources. The Kree captain clarified himself for the Mordian's benefit. Cost fewer lives. My way? will bring a swift end to this conflict, said Stitchell. It will free up our respective forces for more vital duties than defense of some insignificant mudball. It will send out a message that any incursion upon the Emperor's lands, any inch of them, will provoke instant retribution. I was placed in charge of this operation, and I... But I outrank you, acting captain! I was sent here because the Parto Minotaurum dissatisfied with your rate of progress. So, I will take charge of operations now, while you prepare your guardsmen to climb out of the trenches and fight. As soon as I have a battle plan drawn up, I am sending them over the top. The Iron Guard force took up residence in the creek trenches. As the creek had a had inched across the force. They had left many tunnels and dugouts behind them. The Bordians left their kit bags neatly packed. They didn't lay down bedrolls. They didn't expect to stay that long. Like their captain, they found their subterranean surroundings distasteful. They occupied themselves by cleaning and oiling their weapons, and the smell of boot polish also drifted into the air. For their part, the Krieg mixed little with the newcomers. To a neutral observer, the two groups would have seemed quite different, but it was their common traits, their dour, taciturn demeanors, that maintained a distance between them. If the corpsmen were curious about the Morians' arrival, they didn't show it. It wasn't in their nature to ask questions. Likewise, they accepted their new orders with little discussion, although some, the more experienced grenadiers in particular, must have been surprised to receive them. They trusted their leaders, including their new untested commander, knew what they were doing. They knew from experience that flak armor counted for little against pulse weapons. 450 Krieg corpsmen had just been told that many of them would be dead by sunset. But this didn't seem to trouble them. Death 
was a part of life. The most essential part, and they did not doubt that their sacrifice had been ordained for good reasons. Whatever those reasons may have been. Their acting captain doubted, and he found this an uneasy new sensation. He brooded over the Hollowith in his command headquarters, now in the hands of Morian Tex. It flickered through tactical projections. Each squad in his company was represented by a black skull icon. Each Iron Guard squad was a golden imperial eagle. He couldn't help but notice that by the conclusion of every scenario, far fewer black icons and gold remained on the table. The red flame icons of the Tau were extinguished every time, which was the important thing, he told himself. Still, he had to speak up. He cleared his throat for Stitchell's attention, considering his words carefully. Captain, I feel I must reiterate. Your concerns have been noted, acting captain, said the Mordian falsely. But a larger Tau force could arrive in the system at any moment. None have been detected yet. She ignored his interjection. With that in mind, I consider the casualty rate projected here to be acceptable. Though it is my company, not yours, that would bear the brunt of them. Stigil didn't miss a beat, nor did she meet the Cree captain's eyes, but he was used to that by outsiders. Creek soldiers will spearhead our advance by dint of their experience against this particular foe. By now you must have a measure of these Xenos, yes? My forces can best serve a holding back to begin with. Advancing only once my forces have occupied a gap in their defenses. To outflank the Xenos and destroy them. Stitchell smacked her swagger stick into the gloved palm. This is not exactly what your fable death corpse does. I have heard such inspiring tales of them, charging into enemy fire without heed for their individual lives, striking holy terror into godless hearts, when there had been no other efficient options. The Creek captain rumbled. Then I can depend on them to show such steel today. Our lives are the Emperor's, to disperse as he sees fit. Stitcher nodded, satisfied. I see no speedier way to end this conflict. I concur, said the Creekman, but then added, his speed is our primary concern. The trenches offered no space for the acting captain to gather his troops. He gave his briefing over the general Vox channel. He told his corpsmen what was expected of them. None were raw recruits. Some had served for as long as two years, had been in a situation. All had been in a situation like this one before, and had survived it. Now they had another chance. The captain had impressed down upon them to atone for the sins of their people. He told them all they needed to know to discourage their duty. Then, after a brief hesitation, he told them more. He told them that their orders came from the Morian's captain, and he outlined her own company's role in the, her strategy. Captain Stitchell has my solemn assurance, he concluded, that we will know the meager value of our lives and pray only to advance the Emperor's cause and earn his favor through the sacrifice of them. The Krieg cowered into forward trench and thronged the tunnels leading to it. They placed wooden boxes at strategic points in the mud to help scale the walls more swiftly. The Earthshaker crews remained at their posts for now. They laid down a wide barrage of fire, although they had no visible targets. They only wished to discourage any unseen scouts and keep the town unaware of their intentions. At the appointed moment, the cannons eerily fell silent, as did the corpsmen. 
only whispers carried on the breeze, which may have been prayers swallowed by gas mask and breathing tubes. If any of these soldiers were afraid, there was no way to discern it. In the tunnels behind them, the Iron Guard troopers were equally stoic, but more visibly tense with brooding anticipation. A piercing whistle sounded. The first platoon of corpsmen swarmed over the lips of their trenches. They didn't let out war cries, as others may have done. If silence brought them half a second's grace, then it was worth it. Natal's response was almost instantaneous. Nevertheless, blinding flashes lit up the horizon as pulse driver cannons spat out great goblets of plasma from behind scorched tree trunks or inside skeletal brushes. Their aim, at this distance, couldn't be precise, especially with the Earthshaker's lingering gun smoke obscuring their marks. So numerous were the Krieg, however, that they could hardly miss. Dusty boots pounded the ashy ground. The Krieg knew that the faster they could cross it, the fewer would perish in trying. Even so, it was expected that no more than one in fewer of them would make it to the enemy lines. Back in the forward trench, the Krieg captain could only keep his head down, monitor breathless Vox reports, and picture tower fire ripping through corpsmen fragile bodies. We have sight of the Xenos, a watchmaster reported before being cut off in a splutter of static. That was a cue for which he had been waiting. The captain blew his whistle again, enjoying the second much larger Krieg wave as they surged out into no man's land. They followed in the footsteps of the first platoon, now engaging the Tau firewars in hand-to-hand -hand combat as the captain could hear, but not yet see, through the foliage ahead. Their tactics, essentially, were those employed by the Xenos in previous encounters with little success. <laughs> the irony was not lost upon him. The Tau gun's rate of fire was slowed, but not completely stilled. As the captain pushed himself forward, muscles straining, heart pounding, plasma blasted a hole through a corpsman to his left. He couldn't stop nor miss a step, even had there been a way to save him. The victim couldn't have bit seen his fate coming, nor, Emperor Willing, felt the pain of it. The captain knew that his life, too, could be ripped away from him without warning. Certainly, his newly gained rank would not protect him, It only signified that he had been luckier than most, lived longer than most. Perhaps too long. The Krieg had some advantages denied to the Tau. The Krieg had some advantages denied to the Tau. The Tau had not dug into the earth, lacking the skills to do so, as always. They preferred to hide behind machinery. In this case, mobile platforms that projected energy barriers which the Krieg guns had destroyed in their very first clash. Nor did they, could they, share their enemy's unshakable resolve. Few men, let alone these godless Xenos, did. The sight of faceless corpsmen in their hundreds, flinching not from the onslaught of their guns, bearing down on them like a force of nature. Unstoppable must have struck terror into them. It remained to be seen how much resolve the Morians possessed. They had moved on the second whistle too, but left the trench network by the rear. They were circling around each side of the tow, between the trees, to catch them in a pincer movement. The captain had no way of knowing how far they had got, or whatever they had been discovered yet. He was lucky again. He had made it through the gauntlet. He waded through the shredded remains of thorny bush, which snagged on his greatcoat and tried to drag him back. He burst upon the scene of a furious melee. 
A belligerent wave of charcoal gray crashed into the thin line of glaring red, punching holes through it, bending it out of shape, but not quite breaking through it. Grunts of effort and screams of pain assaulted his ears. As in the trenches, the Krieg had numbers on their side. Out here, though, the tower had more space to maneuver, to protect each other's flanks, to avoid being pinned and make full use of their weapons. The captain spied one firing a pulse carbine into the crush, with abandon. The battle line shifted, opening a path to it. Seeing him, it spun around too late. He hit its shoulder first and thrust his bayonet into its side. These rank-and-file soldiers were only lightly armored. He found a gap between parable red plates and drew cyan blood from the Xenos' throat. It let out a guttural gasp as it stiffened. The captain bore it down into the dirt. He was stronger than he was, but pinned by his greater equipped weight. It still managed somehow to twist around beneath him. He knocked aside the barrel of its gun as it fired, its muzzle flash singeing his epaulets. He drove the Xenos, four-fingered hand into the ground, clenching his teeth in grim satisfaction as he heard splintering bones. He wrenched the carbine from a deadened grip, casting it aside. A pair of sensor lights in the Xenos' full-face helmet blinked frantically up at him. It was calling for help, he imagined, but the helmet's antenna had snapped off in the fall. Its good hand lashed out, seizing the captain's throat. His bayonet couldn't seem to find another seam, blunting itself on metal veneer. He spun his last gun around and drove its butt into the Xenos' head, repeatedly. He broke its helmet and the skull beneath it. Its fate, he was confident, was sealed. The only question now was if he could outlast it or not. The captain's head began to swim as his starved lungs strained and ached. Each of his rifle thrusts felt weaker than the last. His vision tunneled until he could only see those damn lights nestled in the fragments of the Xeno's helmet, somehow still mocking him. It occurred to him distinctly that neither of those combatants showed his true face to the other. He was barely aware of the moment when a choking grip upon him loosened. He rolled off the Xeno's limp body, leaving it to the others. Two core men had made it to his side, to make sure it was dead. Awareness of his surroundings crept back into his brain. As his brain soaked up much-needed filtered air, he heard muzzy voices through his earpiece, but couldn't make out what they were saying. The Tau had let off more photon grenades, protected by their helmets from their debilitating effects. His own eyes, however, told him more than the Voxnet could have. The Xenos were holding their lines, and worse, they were pushing their attackers back. Reinforcements were entering the fray, including some in full battle suits. Pulse fire sizzled over the captain's head. Boots trampled the ashy ground around them. Strewn between them was an ever increasing number of bodies, more Krieg than Tau. Their masked faces gapping sightlessly at him. He pushed himself back to his feet. The familiar stink of faceling smoke and blood wrinkled his nose. Even though it was a rebreather, even through his rebreather, and it invigorated him. It occurred to the captain that perhaps he should say something to his troops. He knew they needed no words of encouragement, however. Their orders hadn't changed, thanks to the Tau grenades. He expected that Few would hear him anyway. He operated his comm bead with his tongue and spoke huskily into it. You know what the Emperor expects of you. A battlesuit came plowing through the melee towards him. Several corpsmen prowled atop it, but it shrugged them off with ease. Its featureless head snapped this way and that, scanning, analyzing, 
its bulky metal torso pivoted at the waist. The blue fire flashed from its oversized gun arms. Another Krieg soldier in mid-leap towards it was summarily incinerated. The captain braced himself to meet the juggernaut. Not for the first time. He wished he had his predecessor's bolter. The blast that killed him had left nothing salvageable, not even his badges of rank. Although the core men had to make the most of what they had. So why should he be different? He plucked the magnetic crack grenade from his belt and thumbed its timer rune. He could blow that armor wide open, he thought. If he could just time it right. A lesser fire war broke free of a pair of opponents, stumbling backwards as it tried to get a bead on them. It collided with the captain. He barely glanced at its direction. He swiped its legs out from under its body with a side kick. Its shot went wild as it fell, striking one of its own allies. The, coo the two corpsmen were upon it before it could fire again. He rested his sights upon the battlesuit. He made his leap. We've been made captain. The tarse voice of a Mordian sergeant broke the company's vox silent much sooner than Stitchell had inspected. She cursed under her breath. What happened? She demanded. The Krieg. For a moment, that was all the explanation she was given. In the background of the Vox channel, and ahead of her, too, she realized she heard gunfire. The sergeant spoke again. They broke. The Xenos broke them. We just ran into a squad of them, fleeing for their lives. And the tower right behind them. Those skull sons of orcs led them right to us. Stitcher was already running. All squads, forward, double time. She instructed through her combat. Close with the enemy, engage and cleanse these mud ball of those blue blood scum. How in the whoop could this have happened? She seethed. Her chest burned and went white-hot fury, surpassing even that. She hailed for the Xenos. From the moment she had met the Krieg, she had felt distaste towards them. She had heard all of the rumors about their gas mask might be hiding. Even so, the very last thing she had imagined was that they would turn out to be cowards. When this was over, she swore she would personally see that any guardsman whose back had been turned to the enemy would face justice. Stitchell's scouts were exchanging shots with Xenos through the trees. The morning spread out in search of more sniping positions. The last guns were triplex pattern, more versatile than most. In incineration mode, she believed they could push through Tau armor. Stitchell's bolt pistol packed more power still, albeit at shorter range. She flattened her back against an ancient gnarled tree trunk and spat molten bolts at any flash of red she saw. The tower were already falling back, although few shots had yet been fired. A minute ago, they had been running down the ill-disciplined cowards. The sight of the Iron Guard's gleaming rank sweeping towards them with military precision had doubtless overawed them. Keep on them, Stitchell commanded. Take them out before they can rejoin their main force. She ducked as a pole shot ripped through the tree above her head. Its leaves caught fire, and a burning branch fell across her shoulders. Her ordinates back at HQ in the dugout were running through projections based on the frantic slew of field reports. The odds are still favor us to us, ma'am, but we must expect more casualties than we envisioned. Pulling out now would squander our current advantage and likely, in the long run, result in... We press on, Stitchell summed up, and finish as planned. She cricked her neck, feeling a bruise where the branch had hit her. Her platoon laid down a curtain of covering fire, behind which she darted from her tree to the next. 
then to another. Her guardsmen dutifully kept pace with her, even when the Xeno's pulse beams suppressed, but not extinguished, scythe through their limbs and cut at least a dozen of them down. Slumped against Stitchell's tree was a blown fire warrior, bleeding from its throat. Its sensors lit up at her hurried approach, but the only movement it could muster was a feeble twitch. She shot it in the head and kicked it out of her way, as much for the satisfaction of it to nullify its minimal threat. It occurred to her that she had seen no sign of any Krieg, alive or dead. She chose a target some ten feet ahead and emptied her magazine in its direction. The Tau's red helmet disappeared as it was felled or routed. Stitchell's reloaded and was about to move again when a furious barrage of light and noise forced her to dark back behind cover. Squatting in a hollow was a red cylindrical pod, four feet high and slightly wider. A dome-shaped lid was just clicking back into its position, but almost at once it rose again with an electronic barbel. The cylinder's midsection rotated twenty degrees clockwise, and its newly exposed row of three gun barrels flashed and thundered once again. Its target was five strong Mordian squad, who, like Stitchell, had been steeding closer to it. Unlike her, they sensed the peril too late. The sergeant taken point was killed outright. Stitchell couldn't see how many more were wounded. One had to be half-carried, half-dragged back to behind the trees. It's motion activated, she yelled to anyone within range of her voice. Maybe heat sensitive too. We'll try to pin us down here while the Tau regroup behind it. Don't try to circle around it. There are probably others. Venchmit! The grizzled Morian veteran hurried up to her, creeping low. Venchmit was her explosive expert. He peered around the captain's tree but yanked his head back quickly as the Xeno's turret spun up to target him. It'll take more than a grenade to dent the armor plating, he reported. The captain concurred ruefully. We don't have time to bring up artillery support. What if we can knock out its guns? Then Schmidt was already nodding. He knew exactly what she was suggesting. Stitchell briefed her troopers via Vox. She assigned two squads to draw the turret's fire. She impressed upon them the need for caution but knew they were taking a huge risk all the same. There was no other way. A brave trooper skirted need for caution, but knew they were taking a huge risk all the same. There was no other way. A brave trooper skirted the edges of the tunnel's range. Such was its firing speed that even prepared several were still whinged by its pulse beam. One guardman caught his foot in the undergrowth, stumbled, and was blasted dead center in the chest. Then Schmidt knelt with a heavy grenade launcher on his shoulder. As soon as the turret's protective lid was raised, he blasted a crack grenade at it. Stitchell heard him berating himself as it fell short. She clicked her tongue impatiently, but couldn't deny that it had been a difficult shot. He reloaded dutifully and hoisted the launcher again. He had to wait for the smoke of the first explosion to clear. He drew in a breath and held it. Stitchell braced him to lessen the small chance of recoil throwing off his aim. When she could see the turret again, its lid was closed. Then its midsection gave a little jerk, and Venchmit squeezed the trigger. This time he showed off the timing and precision for which Stitchell had recruited him to be her command squad. In that instant, with the lid became fully extended, the crack grenade dropped into the turret's open mouth. The ensuing detonation was muffled, but Telltale's smoke scurled from the innards of the machine. It continued to twist this way and that, reacting to potential targets, but it was toothless now. Stitcher ordered her platoon to advance, but to give the turret a wide berth. Her instincts were validated once again as it let out a defeated beep and self-destructed, with enough force to uproot the smaller trees around it. 
the Tao were waiting, and the numbers had increased. Suddenly, howling fire warriors were coming at them from all sides. The air crackled with energy discharges. Fire at will and dispatch these filthy beasts to the Emperor's mercy! Captain Stitcho bellowed. As many troopers as could respond. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma the order itself had hardly been needed. But a show of rigid discipline was always beneficial. She drew and activated her gleaming chainsword, feeling its powerful judder through the bones of her hands. She swung it at the nearest target and was pleased to feel its shrieking blades biting into armor. She had cut into the Xeno's carbine too, sparks erupting from the chamber when it fired. The Tau warrior dropped the gun, but her only other weapon was a flimsy-looking ornate knife. Sigil wished she could see the terror on the Xeno's face as she closed with it. Its useless blade snapping on her armor-threaded dress uniform. Her chainsword cut a gash across its stomach, and the stench of oil and blood filled her nostrils. Captain Vilmine Stitchell immersed herself in the joy of righteous combat. The decision she had taken had brought her company here. Now, it was her strength, her guts, and her mechanicus forged weapons that would win or lose the day. Each time her sword sliced through the Xeno's neck, or a bolt from her pistol broke its armor, she felt a savage pride in her achievement. Each time an ally fell within her sight, it only drove her to fight harder. It began to feel like the latter was happening more often than the former. She redoubled her own efforts, barking at her troopers to do the same. She demanded Vox updates, but in the full-blooded chaos of battle, her ordinance struggled to get the data for accurate predictions. She ordered her sergeants to sound off, to report on the health of their squads, but too many failed to respond. Sitchell took a step back to reload her pistol. Something bounced off her highly polished toe cap. A small red disc with a light blazing blue in its center. The next thing she knew, she was coming round as if from a month's long sleep. She had no idea where she was, only that she was lying in a regulation bunk. She was cheeked down in dry leaves and dirt and realized with horror, blind and deaf, Memory rushed back, and with it, muzzled sounds, telling her that the combat around her was still raging. That indeed, she could only have been out for a second. Blinking fiercely, she saw only vague light patterns through darkness. She was helpless. She didn't even dare raise her head in case it was shot off by an enemy she couldn't perceive. All she could do, though... It went very much against the grain, was played dead until her senses returned. That, and pray. God, Emperor, forbid that I should die today, lest still that my proud company should fall in such a small, insignificant war. Stitchell mouthed to herself. Her answer came in the form of hopeful voices breaking through the dead silence in her ears. She wasn't sure... She was hearing right at first. Reports of the Tau being caught off guard and massacred. By what? She wondered. She pushed herself to her feet, no doubt before she ought to have done. She felt the heat of pulse beams around her ears. She throttled her chainsword and squared her jaw as if ready to defend herself. Gradually she began to make out writhing shapes. Charcoal gray human shapes and blank eyed expressionist skulls. It's the Krieg. She recognized her lieutenant's voice, reporting to HQ. I don't know how, but they're back and they're fighting like devils. The Tau thought they were beaten. They turned their backs on them, and now they're being slaughtered. By the time Captain Stitchell could see again, everything had changed. 
The Imperial forces had very much gained the upper hand, and even she couldn't help but be impressed by the ferocity with which the Krieg soldiers fought. The grenadiers hefted flamer weapons, which engulfed the Xeno scum in cleansing fire. A Tao's head, still encased in armor, bounced to her feet. Behind you, ma'am, a muffled Krieg voice cautioned her, and Stitcher whirled just in time for her sword to eviscerate a charging Tao. She couldn't have thanked the helpful Coleman, even had she thought of doing so. She could no longer tell which one of them had been. A hovering red gunship nudged too close into the melee, restricted in its movements by dead trees, seeking out clear targets for its formidable weapons. The Krieg dealt with it in the same way that they had the Tau in battle suits, though this was a larger and deadlier threat by far. Death Corbman streamed towards it without hesitation, regardless of how many were blasted to slag in the attempt. They threw themselves into the gunship's hull and clung to it, fighting to reach the startled crew within. Stitchell would have called them fearless if it had not been for their recent actions. She couldn't make sense of it. A Krieg engineer, marked out by his short tunic jacket, found himself surrounded, as perhaps he intended to be. He was already clutching a rusty-looking canister. He twisted its top, and green vapor bellowed from it. The engineer kept fighting with pistol and bayonet sword. The gas did not affect him. Doubtless thanks to his rebreather, but Stitchell, who was the closest Mordian to it, felt burning in her nostrils and her throat. She backed away from the toxic cloud, fuming at her allies. Reckless! They may have been immune to their own chemical weapons, but her people certainly weren't. Even the Tau had some protection from their helmets. Then Stitchell glanced again at the cloud wreath writhing Xenos. Their armor plates bubbled and blistered, sweating rivulets of red. Reckless. Or oh, just ruthless. As the engineer's tactics had been, they were certainly effective. It was also quite possible that Stitchell had ended up exactly where she needed to be. She spied a new figure on the battlefield, a Tau larger than most of the others, with a flowing white cloak and hair to match. Its armor was more ornate, but to her eyes no stronger than the rest of its fellows. It wielded a rifle and sheathed a longsword, which similarly looked more like a relic than a functional weapon. What startled and repulsed her was that it showed its flat gray face Malice twisting its hideous features, it barked out orders to the other Xenos, its blade prodding one back into the fray when it faltered. Their leader, she thought, and she set her sights on reaching it. Five warriors tried to bar her path, but they were fighting a losing battle now. Most failed to the Krieg, or to Stitchell's own troopers before she could even engage them. The Tau leader saw her coming and turned to snarl at her. It startled her again by addressing her in a thickly accented low gothic. We die today for the greater good. It growled and unsheathed its sword. Yes, agreed Stitchell through her teeth as their sword struck blue sparks off each other. The hungry teeth of hers, shredding the antique blade. You will. The battle concluded in glorious imperial victory. Stitchell felt ashamed of herself for ever doubting it. Was the emperor not always with those who served him diligently? She liked to think she herself had slain the Cadre Fireblade, though in the end the killing blow could have come from any of the several soldiers. 
Their achievements came at a considerable cost, however. Always, there was a cost, and she had a battle yet to fight. Mordian medics tended to the wounded, and less fortunate were gathered up in body bags, which their comrades carried reverently back to the dropships. Perhaps one day they could be buried in their fallen homeworld soil. More likely not. Their names, of course, would be added to the Iron Guard's honor rolls. The fallen Krieg were stripped and left, like the Xenos, where they lay. Stitchell thought it disrespectful that even their uniforms were taken, although their mask remained in place. Their hoses disconnected. She thought it now mercy that she couldn't see their faces. The Earth will reclaim their bodies in time. McCormick explained in a dispassionate tone when she questioned him. Cover them up. Pile some leaves on top of them. Do that much at least, she insisted. The creep began to haul the earth shakers out of the trenches, using ropes to latch them to centaur utility vehicles. Stitcher located the commander, at least pitching in with them. Courtesy demanded that she speak with him in private, but she was too angry to wait. What in the warp happened back there? She demanded, marching up to him with her fist clenched. Captain Stitchell, he greeted her. Your soldiers, your so-called death corpsmen, ran from the enemy. A tactical decision was made. The warp it was, she snapped. Where were your commissars? Why weren't they keeping discipline? Bolt rounds to the temples for the first few men to weaken would have stiffened the backbone of the rest. We have never acquired... He tried to interject, but she talked over him. Never once in all my service have I witnessed such disgraceful cowardice, such blatant disrespect for the Emperor. There will be consequences for this, mark my words. If you cannot whip your troops into line, acting captain, then I... A decision was made, the Cree captain repeated, more forcefully by officers in the field, based on real-time projections of the evolving situation. Stitchell couldn't believe what she was hearing. Then your soldiers were ordered to retreat? By your own officers? The captain shook his head. Too faint. Stitchell expressed her derision with a snort. We saw an opportunity to misdirect the Xenos. We played on the arrogance to make them believe that they could break us. Then we led them into a trap. Led them straight to my company, you mean? Enough of them. Yes. I believe the results speak for themselves. The Tau were defeated, at the cost of Imperial lives far lower than projected, in the reign of 22% lower than I am told. Yes. She wanted to say... But it was the Morian lives that were lost. She bit her tongue, realizing how churlish that would sound. But hadn't my people lost so much already? I told you in the dugout, she said tartly, changing tact, that all decisions would be made by me. This should have been run by me. The Kriegman cleared his throat. Ah, pardon me, Captain Stitchell, but this is the first time we met. She blinked at him, nonplussed. I was not the officer with whom you conversed in the dugout. He clarified. That man died ninety minutes ago in single combat with Xenos in a battlesuit. I I must have... I must have missed the report. As the next longest-serving member of our company, I inherited his rank. I'm sorry for your loss. Stitcher only looked at the captain's mask, his tank commander badge, and his bearing now, though. She thought he was a little taller than the other. He sounded younger, too. They had both sounded young, 
now that she came to think of it. The captain knew the value of the Krieg life, said the new captain. He gave his and ordered a land and mortal blow upon a powerful foe. He expended his life well, was all that Stitchell could think to say. There is no cause to mourn. Your troop ship remains in orbit, I believe. She nodded. And the sooner I get back to it, the better. My corpsmen could hunt down any surviving Xenos here and show that no machinery remains with which they can summon others. I'm sure the Emperor has more glorious purpose for you. If there was a sardonic edge to the Kriegman's voice, Stitchell couldn't tell. Her anger, robbed of its focus, had drained away from her. She felt weary. She voxed her command staff, instructing them to prepare for immediate departure. The Krieg's new commander still stood, looking blank-eyed at her, as if expecting more. She couldn't quite turn her back on him. Hesitantly, she asked, Did he... Did you... Do any of you have names? The captain was honored with the name of a Krieg warrior of old. He was called Regal. Stitchell nodded. Captain Regal will be remembered. Receiving a vox from her second in command, she used this as an excuse to step away. When next she glanced in the Krieg captain's direction, he had returned to his work. She almost couldn't tell him from the other fearless, faceless soldiers, bleating about, saying little, entirely focused on their duties. She recalled that not one of them had flinched from the charge across no man's land into enemy fire. She thought about the Krieg who had sacrificed themselves in the final battle, in exchange for the small set of advantages. All she had heard about them had been right. They would give up their lives in a heartbeat for the Emperor. But that didn't mean they thought them worthless. Resources. The captain. The old captain, Regal. Had called them. The captain knew the value of Krieg life. The same as that of Morian life, it seemed. Or any other. As long as it could be expended in the Emperor's service. All right, that's going to do it for another video this week. <sighs> yeah. oh. Hopefully you guys appreciate the hard work I put into this. What I believe to be 40 minutes. I'm taking a guess right now that this is going to be a 40 minute video. Almost 30 Maybe a little over than 40, like 45, maybe uh, 50. Anyways, let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. We have Mr. Crossman123, Coco, Zakula Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldritch Maltrade, Ortiz Unum, Nicholas Gurr, Lilac NPC, Starboard, Thompson235, Azuth89, Josh Sickles, and Angela Nicholas. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel, for supporting the channel, and being able to see the videos ahead of time faster and more efficiently than anyone else on the channel will ever be able to. If you want to see videos ahead of time, well, that is the place to be. If you want to see bloopers and art and other things such as the library that is ever-growing thanks to the Patreon support members. <clears throat> Ongoing support. You too can be a part of that in the link in the description down below. Anyways, I've been me, you have been you, thank you for watching another one of these videos, and tell me in the comments what you think about the Death Corps of Krieg. Would you be interested in starting up an army of them? Or are you still on the fence, or thinking about starting the Mordian Iron Guard? Or if you're a history buff like me, and are weirdly into World War I and World War II and the history and such of that, then 
the Death Corps of Krieg, or maybe the Vastorian Firstborn, are more along your speed. Or if you're more interested in having Kyphus Kane in your army, maybe another guard army would be more up your street. Or maybe you're a Tau sympathizer and, well, wish to have a few far more battle suits on the table than uh, fire warriors. Which army are you thinking about starting? Or if you already have, which one do you currently collect? Let me know in the comment section down below. And let's discuss about what we think the new 10th edition will bring. I already know what my version of Warhammer has, and I already love it. Alright, until next time, stay safe out there, and have yourselves a good one. Bye-bye.